Hi, this is Swapnil Bhatia from Mukta.com. It's an important day for us today because we are introducing a series of videos on YouTube called Mukcast. In this uh, series of videos, we will cover a range of topics. We will interview a lot of people from Linux and free software world. We will give you a wrap up of what happened in the last seven days. So it's a weekly event. We will uh, review software as well as hardware and at the same time, We'll also uh, discuss serious issues around GNU Linux and open source technologies as well as communities. So when we were planning this uh, video series, we were thinking about what topic we should pick to launch this series. We were at LinuxCon where we met and interviewed a lot of people. Those interviews are still in production stage. We are, we are editing them and we'll publish them as soon as possible. So we picked the interview of Ibn Optan, who is uh, the founder of Raspberry Pi Foundation. At the same time, he works with Broadcam. If you look at Raspberry Pi, it doesn't need any introduction. It is one of the most uh, popular devices around. But I was curious about the history of this device and the foundation. So I asked Ibn if he can talk a little bit about uh, the, the history of Raspberry Pi, its beginning. Okay. Raspberry Pi was an attempt by a group of us at the University in Cambridge to solve a recruitment crisis that we were having in the middle part of the last decade. So we found we were not having it, that we had too few people applying to study computer science, and we found that the, the range of skills that people had when they came in the door, these were still incredibly bright young people, but the range of skills they had when they came in the door was nothing like what people had in the mid-1990s. And Raspberry Pi has now evolved as a huge uh, revolution, there is a huge open source community around it where people are writing different tools for it, they are using it in a different way. Even Google released a, a tool called Coder which converts a Raspberry Pi device into a web server. So what Eben thinks about it? Yes, what's been really fantastic about the Pi is the extent to which um, other people, because we've kind of pursued, because We've ended up in a situation where the amount of innovation that's coming out of the community kind of dwarfs the amount of innovation. It was really interesting to hear Gabe Newell talk about this earlier here at LinuxCon, is that if you create open, open platforms, then you allow your community to, to, to kind of take the lead in innovating. Um, I think the Google Coder example is really fantastic. I, I, I didn't know anything about that until the announcement. Um, I think one or two, somebody else at the foundation had been sp speaking to Google about it, uh, but I didn't know anything about it, so I was, I was as surprised as anyone when I saw that last week. He's right about community, and companies who deal with free software and open source should understand that even if they have the brightest and the smartest brain on their payroll, there will always be people who are smarter, who are brighter, than their own employees and the innovation from these people will dwarf the innovation and development than you do in-house. So it's always a good idea to engage with the larger open source community and benefit from their work as well. Now if you look at the example of Coder, though even made it clear that somebody from Raspberry Pi was working with Google but he was surprised with that announcement. And sometimes a lot of people from free software world think of this surprise element as lack of transparency. Some people think that companies should be transparent about their projects and products from the first day when they wrote the first line of code. I do not agree with it to some extent because surprise has its own PR value at the same time. You tell everybody about a product when it's actually ready for people to see. So let's see what uh, Ibn says about surprises, does it mean lack of transparency, or does it have its own value? No, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I mean, you know, those are all good surprises. Um, you know, like I say, um, somebody else at the foundation, that's one of the other things that's an interesting learning experience for me is that the Raspberry Pi has now become a large enough organization that I don't know everything that's going on inside the organization. Um, so, as I say, somebody, somebody else in the organization had been talking to Google about it, but it was a surprise to me and it was a, it was a great surprise. So, you know, if I, if I had a surprise like that every day, it'd be a, it would be a lot of fun. Exactly. And that is the beauty of surprises. Now, I'll go back to the hardware aspect of Raspberry Pi. It's, it's not easy. It's actually very hard to bring open hardware to the market. 
we have seen uh, how company like Canonical struggled to raise fund for their Ubuntu Edge project, which eventually failed. Uh, we are also uh, witnessing how Aaron Siegel from KDE is trying to bring Vivaldi tablet to the market. He's, he has not gone to any fundraising route. So let's see how Raspberry Pi Foundation has managed to raise funds to bring the hardware to the market. Mm. The interesting thing about the Raspberry Pi Foundation is we're largely funded by our own, um, by the profits that we make from selling Raspberry Pi. So we're, unlike most charities, we don't really, we don't do fundraising. We don't do you know, conventional fundraising. However, we were extremely lucky at the start of the year that Google UK um, offered us a million dollars of funding to specifically to put pies into the hands of children in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Um, and that was, I mean, it's been extremely helpful. So we've, um, I think we, we will have shipped by the end of the year, we will have shipped between 15 and 16,000 Raspberry Pi kits. So that's a Raspberry Pi, a case, a power supply, and an SD card. We will have shipped between 15 and 16,000 kits um, to children in the UK via our partner organization. So we don't, you know, we're still a very small organization. We don't do this ourselves. So we have five or six partner organizations, including uh, Coda Dojo, uh, Code Club, um, uh, and OCR, the, who's, who are one of the examination boards uh, in the UK. And they're responsible for taking pies from us. We were funded by Google. We take pies, um, we deliver them to our partners, and our partners are responsible for identifying children who they think will benefit from having a pie in their, in their bedroom. Google assists a lot of open source projects, and Raspberry Pi is one of them. What is interesting about Raspberry Pi is that it is being used in schools a lot. So I'm curious if the device has started to have an impact on the curriculum of such schools, if the device has started to change the mindset of students and uh, teachers about open source and Linux. Let's say what Eben has to say about it. I, I, think, it's, I think it's very early days. I think that you, you know, it, it's really only the past six to nine months that these things have been available in sufficient quantity that education systems can order them. I think we, you know, we do see some schools at the moment, particularly um, private schools um, and um, uh, what we call academies um, or um, uh, which are effectively like charter schools and I think in America in American language those are those would be charter schools so we see uh, some of those schools that have a little more freedom in terms of their their um, engagement with the curriculum we see some of those schools um, buying pies in quite large numbers um, to, to give to children. I think it's going to be a while though before all schools and in particular before conventional state schools in the UK um, adopt pie in large numbers that's right and I hope as the device becomes more popular it will start influencing the curriculum and it will also change people's approach towards open source and Linux. If you look at the, the basic device, it has remained more or less same ever since it was launched. Just there are significant improvements. There are a lot of hardware modules that you can add to enhance the, the features or usability of the device. So I'm curious what's going on behind the scene. I'm curious, what are the areas where the foundation is investing its resources in? And at the same time, I'm curious, what was the next big thing we can expect from Raspberry Pi? I think the next big thing from us is our improved desktop support. So we've been spending a lot of time, energy, money on uh, improving the desktop, the desktop user experience on the Pi. We're very committed to making the Pi a great platform for, for um, particularly for multimedia. It's got a fantastic, the, you know, the chip that we use, 20, BCM2835, has got a fantastic multimedia accelerator in there. So we do see a lot of people already using the Pi as an Xbox, as a um, XBMC, as a, as, a, as a media center. Um, so what we're trying to do is get some of that um, multimedia, get some of that multimedia capability into the hands of people who are just doing desktop applications. So with this in mind, we've been spending a lot of money on Wayland, uh, the next generation compositing uh, desktop, uh, desktop protocol. Um, we spend a lot of money on GStreamer, um, WebKit integration, lots of these things to make the Pi a more attractive general purpose machine. Uh, it's important, I guess, for two reasons. One, I guess, developing world applications. We do think that there's a big future for Linux machines, and in particular, on Linux machines in the developing world. And secondly, we've always believed that these, these machines have to be good fun. They have to be things that children will engage with. So you've got to be able to play games, you've got to be able to play video, you've got to be able to go on Facebook. So, you know, trying to make the platform a more usable general purpose computer helps with our educational mission. That is quite ambitious and interesting, the 
the way Raspberry Pi is evolving and it's growing bigger and bigger. I'll go back to the question of hardware where I forgot to ask that. I, I really understand how hard it is to bring uh, open hardware to the market. I was talking to Aaron Siegel of KD and he was discussing how difficult it is to talk to hardware manufacturers to bring open hardware to the market. So what challenges were there for Raspberry Pi? How they tackle these challenges? Um, it's been a, uh, it was certainly very challenging to hit our cost targets. We, um, we started out, I mean, I guess, you know, we reversed into our implementation. So we started out with a cost target. We started out with this $25 target. Uh, and it took us years. It took us, I think, four years from 2006 when we started. It took us four years to even have any hardware that was acceptable to us. So we're very lucky. Um, uh, we, uh, the relationship with Broadcom has been very helpful for us in terms of getting access to, um, to really good silicon. Um, so, and a number of people, including, including me, um, uh, who were involved with Pi were also involved in the BCM2835 project at Broadcom in Cambridge. So we kind of, it's kind of our chip. The chip that's in Raspberry Pi is kind of our baby. Um, so so that, was, that was very helpful. But it, it did take us a long time, even once we had the chip, it took us a long time to put in place the, the supply chain, uh, a, a design which was cheap enough, you know, a design which was, um, had little enough in addition to the core, the core processing unit, uh, and to put in place a supply chain and business model that will allow us to operate at fairly operate sustainably at fairly thin margins. That's true and Broadcom has played a very important role in bringing this device to the market. The hardware is the USB of this device because it brings the cost of computing down. If you look at the price factor, the device makes a lot of sense in big countries like India or a lot of African countries. Though I understand that Raspberry Pi is very strong in North America and Europe. But I'm curious, what plans do they have for brick countries where people cannot afford uh, computers because of their high price? So yeah, let's see if Eben can talk a bit about the current market of Raspberry Pi yeah. and what plans do they have for brick yeah. countries? So right now, uh, North America is our largest market, um, I think followed by Germany and then the UK um, in terms of monthly shipments. I think the, U the UK, at least until very recently, still had the largest install base because obviously we were very big in the UK very early on. Um, I think going forward, uh, we're putting a lot of effort into understanding how we can um, go to market in India more effectively, how we can go to market in South America, particularly Brazil, without, um, currently there are large tariff barriers, uh, which push, I think, a Raspberry Pi past 70 or $80. In, uh, in, de delivered in Brazil today. So we're trying to work out how we can um, not be exposed to those tariff issues. And then I think in the medium term, our attention really is turning to Africa in a big way. We think Africa is an enormous opportunity for Linux. We think um, uh, it's an enormous opportunity for ARM Linux um, and for, for Raspberry Pi and for other machines like Raspberry Pi. That's good news for uh, yeah. BRIC countries, especially for uh, African countries and uh, hopefully South America as well. Now I'll talk a little bit about the software and community aspect of Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is not just about open hardware, there's a huge open source community around it. And you have to maintain a fine balance between what you want and what the community needs. So what kind of relationship is there between Raspberry Pi and the open source community? Um, we, we've always spent a lot, a lot of effort on community relations. You know, we had a, my wife Liz runs our, uh, our, our website. Uh, and our Twitter presence. Um, she's. We, we've had community. We've we've had a community relations person before we had anything else. Um, and she's been working on this for over two years now. Um, so it's useful. It's, it's it's useful and important to us for, for several reasons. I mean, obviously, it gives us an idea of. It can be a. You know, it can be as simple as it's a source of free engineering. You know, you, you wouldn't believe the sorts of really valuable things that people have done. I think we got. We very early on, a couple of months in, we got an email from some guy said we got a pull request from a guy said you know pull this five line patch your SD card performance will double, you know things like that. Um, so it's a source of uh, of very valuable engineering effort. Um, it also gives us uh, by engaging with the community we get a good idea of where we should be spending our effort. We get a good idea of you know we don't like to pick winners. You know, we don't like to kind of have a fixed idea of what people should be doing with the pie. What we like to do is look at what the community is doing with the pie and look to see whether there are places where we can do a little intervention, where we can go in, spend you know, 
10,000, 20,000, 30,000 dollars uh, on a piece of engineering which will enable the community to, to move forward. And most recently, obviously, we've been doing this with Xbox Media Center. Uh, before I wrap up this interview, I'd like to talk about the buzzword innovation. It really doesn't matter what you're doing today. What matters is what plans do you have for future? Will you remain relevant in future? So I would like to talk a little bit about what what's going on at the innovation front in Raspberry Pi. So, so I think certainly in the, in the short to medium term, it's all about the software. It's all about trying to make the platform, the existing platform better. Um, I think you know we've said we're going to do a version which has better power performance. So we're going to do a we are going to do a board revision um, in the in the medium term. You know, sometime next year we're going to do a board revision which improves the power consumption of the device. Um, but apart from that, we're not really very focused on hardware. We're mostly focused on uh, tuning up the software stack. I said in my talk today, you know, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit available to people, uh, and we're very keen to. Uh, um, we're very keen to go and hunt that down because ultimately we could chase off after another more powerful hardware platform, but what we'd be doing is orphaning everyone who'd already bought a Raspberry Pi. Um, we know at some point in the future, maybe two, three years out, we're going to need to ship new hardware. We can't be shipping, if we're shipping the current hardware in 2017, that's going to be a disaster for us. Um, but yeah, we want to make sure that uh, you know, we, we get as much life as we can out of the platform we have. Thanks a lot, Eben, for this interview. I hope that the people who are watching this interview now know better about Raspberry Pi and more people will buy Raspberry Pi now. That brings us to the end of this first uh, episode of Mukcast. Just let us know what you think about it in the comments below. If you want us to review any product or project, if you want us to cover any topic, just let us know and we will try our best to cover it. So for now, bye-bye. See you next week. Happy hacking.